The reading this morning, the scripture reading, is from Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. I'll begin in verse 1 and read through verse 28. Mark chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea was going out to him, and all the people of Jerusalem, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist, and his diet was locusts and wild honey. And he was preaching, saying, After me, one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. And a voice came out of the heavens, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. Immediately the Spirit impelled him to go out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness forty days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts and the angels were ministering to him. Now after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. As he was going along by the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net in the sea for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I'll make you become fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went away to follow him. They went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and began to teach. They were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. Throwing him into convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. They were all amazed, so that they debated among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. Immediately, the news about him spread everywhere into all the surrounding district of Galilee. As we come to the Gospel of Mark this morning, it is what I am planning for it to be a a, a series probably through the end of the year walking through the Gospel of Mark together. I should say the Gospel according to Mark. I'll mention that again in just a few minutes. Everybody loves a boring biography, right? I mean, the only thing worse than reading about someone else's life is reading about a boring someone else's life. The four Gospels that begin our New Testament are not dispassionate, boring biographies. The Gospel according to Mark, especially so. Mark's account, as you may have noticed in in the reading a few moments ago, Mark's account of the life and death of Jesus begins with speed and energy. He he tells it in dramatic fashion, and it's very fast-paced. There is no effort given by Mark to establish a foundation from which to launch. There's no thought spent on preparing the audience for what's coming. 
No time is wasted on long birth stories. No ink is spilt on childhood experiences of our Lord. No history is discussed about genealogical lineages. One commentator said it is gospel narrative on steroids. The story is all action, beginning to end, and about a third of Mark's gospel is about the last week of Jesus' life. There are more miracles recorded in Mark than any of the other gospels, even though it is by far the shortest. Mark's gospel was the first of the four gospels to be written. And from a theological standpoint, Christology, the doctrine of Jesus Christ, is on center stage throughout the Gospel of Mark. It is, Christology is primary to the theological purpose of the account. Mark's goal is to tell us about Jesus. Now, you may be thinking, and rightly so, the entirety of the Bible is about Jesus. But the Gospels are predominantly so. They give special attention to the substance and the reality of Jesus Christ the Lord. Attention to his life, details about his ministry, and lots of details about his death. The types and the shadows of old, the hints and hopes of yesteryear, the prophecies and promises of time gone by, all converge in this glorious God-man, Jesus Christ, who is Lord. The gospel according to Mark. Mark is the author. We know him from other places in Scripture as John Mark. It's not, as I've already showed my hand on, it's not really Mark's gospel. I mean, that's the way that we talk about it, and I'm still going to refer to it as that, but we understand that it's not a gospel about Mark. It's Mark's rendition of the gospel. It's Mark's telling his firsthand experiences about the gospel. So it's the gospel of Jesus Christ according to John Mark. Mark lived in Jerusalem. In fact, his mother hosted one of the early churches in her home. You remember the story of Peter being in prison in Acts 12, and the church is gathered in a home to pray. That was Mark's mom's house where they were praying when when Peter was released and he goes and shows up and, and the little girl doesn't believe that it's actually him. That's at Mark's mother's home. Mark went on to be a ministry assistant and missionary apprentice who accompanied the Apostle Paul and Barnabas on the first missionary journey. He might be most famously remembered for failing to pan out on that journey, abandoning the mission, leaving them on the field and returning to Jerusalem, Acts 13, 13. So then when the second endeavor, the second missionary journey was set to embark, Barnabas was willing to have Mark assist with the work while the Apostle Paul was insisting that they should not take him along who had deserted them, Acts 15.38. However, later in the Apostle Paul's ministry, he writes to Timothy, 2 Timothy 4.11, pick up Mark and bring him with you for he is useful to me for service. I mean, what an outcome. A great start. He putters out, deserts the mission, goes back home, signs up for service again. The most well-known apostle says, no thanks, you left us the last time. Barnabas takes him under his wing. It evidently is successful, so much so that by the end of Paul's life, he's saying, I need Mark, the one I didn't want before. What hope for us? What great hope for us when we have failed in this area? Or proven to not finish a task in this area. That that doesn't have to be the end. What wonderful hope. J.S. Baxter writing about this reality says this. Those on the heights are not the souls who never erred nor went astray. Who trod unswerving to their goals along a smooth rose-bordered way. 
Nay, those who stand where first comes dawn are those who stumbled but went on. We are a stumbling people. May we be like John Mark, not just a stumbling people, but a people who stumble, yet get up and get on with following Christ and doing his good will. Mark chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's as far as we're getting this morning. I promise we will not drag our feet through the rest of the book. This is, I think I can probably say this with confidence. It is the only time we will just look at one verse. And some of that is because it is kicking it off and it's a thematic introduction. And so that's the approach we're taking. In fact, some would say that this first verse, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, isn't even part of Mark's book, part of the body of it. They would argue that it's the title. Others would say it's an intro. Some would argue that it's an intro to the first section. Others would argue that it's an introduction to the entire book. What we do know from reading it and from looking at it now is that it is a very abrupt start. For Mark, it's the title and the introduction. And he jumps right into the action. Matthew takes 48 verses to get to this point. Luke takes 132 before he gets to this point. But at least Mark is consistent. He ends the gospel just as abruptly as he begins it. They went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had gripped them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The end. So it's an abrupt start. It's an abrupt ending. We'll get there in a few weeks or months. Mark 1.1, I've titled it Pithy Proclamation. It is concise. Mark's gospel is concise and forcefully expressive. It is an official announcement. This is true for the entirety of the book as much as it is for the first verse of the book that we're looking at together this morning. Most people, when they write a book in our day, have a title page, a foreword, a preface, and an introduction. Mark didn't need all that. He condensed it all into this. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. There's title, foreword, preface, and introduction. All there together, encapsulated for us. Let's take that verse, break it into three primary categories. You can probably guess what they are. The first one is gospel. The second one is Jesus Christ. And the third one is Son of God. The beginning of the gospel. Gospel is glad tidings. Good news. It, it is a favorable proclamation. The word coming from the Greek was used to make a celebratory announcement, one like a victory in battle or the enthronement of a king. This is what the word gospel means. It is favorable, it is good, it is glad tidings. So what does Mark mean when he says the beginning of the gospel? We go back to Genesis 1.1. It begins in a similar way. In the beginning, God created the heavens of the earth. That was in the very beginning. And now we have, some 6,000 years later, Mark saying the beginning of the gospel. Is it the beginning of the gospel? Maybe not in the way that we're thinking of it. But it is the beginning in a real way. Prior to Christ coming to earth, God had dealt with his people at a distance. God had loved his people. And as a result, he gave them kings and priests and prophets. But now, as Mark writes, God himself has come in the person of Jesus Christ. And he has come bringing salvation by means of the gospel. 
He has brought salvation as a favorable proclamation for his people. Salvation is not new with the arrival of Christ any more than grace or love or mercy is new. Because it originates with God who is eternal and infinite. But the salvation that took place prior to Jesus is only a scale model of what is now provided in him. God rescued Abraham and Sarah from barrenness and reproductive deadness. But in Jesus, God has rescued us from death itself. God rescued the Israelites from their slavery to Pharaoh in Egypt. But in Jesus, God has rescued us from our sin, bringing us out from the power of Satan to the kingdom of God. God delivered Israel of old to a land flowing with milk and honey, but in Jesus, God brings us to an eternal world, to new heavens and a new earth where righteousness alone dwells always and forever. The beginning of the gospel. Why is it good news? Why does God determine to call his plan to rescue a people good? What's good about the news that Jesus Christ is coming to the world to save sinners? The news is good because of our terrible, miserable, helpless state. The helpless, natural state of unalterable spiritual death that every human is born into. The gospel is good because by nature... We are unaffected by God's sovereign rights in our life or in the world at large. The gospel is good news because by nature we are careless and indifferent about the state of our soul. The gospel is good news because by nature we sin freely without any meaningful conviction of sin. The gospel is good news because by nature we have no dread of hell or God's right to send us there. The gospel is good news because by nature we are unchanged by what we know and confess to believe about Jesus Christ. The gospel is good news because by nature we are Pharisee-like with an interest in forms of religion rather than truth or sincere heartfelt religion. The gospel is good news because by nature we are indifferent to the means of grace, the Bible, prayer, prayer public and private worship. The gospel is good news because by nature, we want enough religion to be free from the penalty of sin, but not its power. The gospel is good news because by nature, we are recognized by the world as one of its own. The gospel is good news because by nature, we are unconcerned for the glory of God and the spread of his kingdom. The gospel is good news because by nature we are earthly minded instead of heavenly minded. By nature we are in a terrible, miserable, helpless state of unalterable spiritual death. And only one remedy can overcome any and all of these issues it's the gospel which is why it is good news. The good news that Jesus came to the world to save sinners. Salvation by Christ alone remedies all of these problems. Salvation by Christ alone remedies all of our problems ultimately. The gospel is a favorable proclamation. It is a celebratory announcement. The gospel is a herald of hope, a pronouncement of pardon, The gospel is a revelation of redemption. It is an announcement of victory, the beginning of the gospel. And Mark continues, the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ. First, let's consider Jesus. Point number two. Jesus literally translates Yahweh saves, Jehovah saves, or God is salvation. There was no hidden agenda here. This is what he's coming to do. 
God became a man. You shall call his name Jesus, the angel told Mary, for he will save his people from their sins. From the moment of the Virgin Mary's conception of Jesus, his divine nature became permanently united to his human nature in the now and forever incarnate Son of God. Jesus saves. Jesus had a normal human birth with an actual human genealogy. I mentioned before, Mark gives zero time to it, but other gospel writers do. This is the way that the apostle writes to the church at Galatia. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. He was born of a woman like every other person who's ever been born. He was born under the law, just like every other person who has been born. And he was born that way for a reason, in order that he might be our spiritual head, our representative, our substitute, granting us redemption from the law that we have broken. Jesus had a real human body, and he experienced real growth and experienced physical susceptibilities like hunger and thirst and tiredness and death. Jesus was a real and is a real man, truly human. Not only did Jesus have a human body for his time here on earth, he continues to have a physical body in his resurrected state. He even went to great lengths to make sure his disciples realized this. Luke 24, 39. See my hands and my feet, that it is me. Jesus said to his disciples, touch and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see, that I have. After his resurrection, Jesus returned to the Father by ascending in his divinely re animated, we might say, body before his, right before his disciples' eyes, affirming his ongoing full physical humanity. Jesus did not cease to be fully human after the resurrection. He will be a man forever as he represents redeemed humanity for all of eternity. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus. Given Jesus' divine nature, when we consider that he is God, the, the normalcy or normality of most of his earthly life is staggering. Jesus spent the first 30 years of his life in relative obscurity. Does anybody have any idea what Jesus was doing in years 13 through 29? No. What we can piece together is he was doing manual labor, he's taking care of his family, and being faithful to whatever his heavenly father called him to do. He's God. And he's living in relative obscurity. He comes out of that around the age of 30 in his public ministry. He performs miraculous signs. He delivered authoritative teaching that could only come from God. And this, when it happens, is so shockingly offensive for the people of God of his hometown. They had seen day after day his simplicity and his humility. So in their minds, it was completely incompatible with the messianic wisdom and power that was on display before them. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus. What are the implications for us with regard to Jesus or God becoming the man, Christ Jesus? We along with all of humanity, have been sinful ever since the fall. When Adam fell in the garden, we fell with him. It's easy, therefore, for us to assume that being sinful is an essential necessary part of being human. But this isn't true. Jesus is human and yet did not sin. The fact that God became a man in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ reveals the nature of true humanity. Christ's humanity gives a glimpse of what our humanity would be were it not spoiled and tainted with sin. But it also gives a glorious glimpse of what it will be after the final resurrection. Jesus shows us that the problem with humanity is not that we're humans. 
The problem with us is that we're sinners, fallen sinners. Jesus' human nature shows the potential of humanity as God intended. The display of sinless humanity reaffirms God's declaration that creation in all its original dimensions, material and spiritual, as God intended it, including humanity, is by divine definition, according to Genesis 131, very good. Jesus' humanity enables his representative obedience for us. We saw this in Galatians 4. It's also in Romans 5. As one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, Adam, the many were made sinners, us, so by the one man's obedience, Christ's, the many will be made righteous, us. Because Jesus is truly human, his perfect life of obedience, overcoming all temptations, culminating in his perfect substitutionary death, can take place of human rebellion, can take the place of human rebellion and failure. And not just human rebellion and failure out there somewhere, but our rebellion and our failure, our sin, Christ's perfect life, his obedience, His overcoming all temptation, his perfect substitutionary death is in our place as his people. Because of his humanity, he can be a substitutionary sacrifice for mankind. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of his people. And make propitiation for the sins of his people, he did. A man, the God man, died on the cross when Jesus died. And his death truly atones for the sin of human beings whose nature he shares. All who come to him in repentance and faith shall be saved. Jesus' humanity makes him the only effective mediator between God and man. 1 Timothy 2, 5, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Jesus' divine nature and human nature enable him to stand in the gap between fallen humans and a holy God. Jesus' humanity enabled him to become a sympathetic high priest who experientially understands the difficult plight of humanity in a fallen world. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Jesus' perfect humanity means that he is a true example and pattern for human character and conduct. For to this you have been called, Peter writes, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not the beginning of God. Not the beginning of the second person of the Trinity. Not the beginning of the salvation of God's people. But the beginning of God becoming a man. The beginning of the humanity of God's Son. The beginning of the active work of God required to save sinners. And that is Mark's thrust. That's the beginning that he's talking about. It's the beginning of God coming down, being veiled in frail flesh. It is the beginning of the second person of the Trinity being named Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And it is the beginning of Jesus, the Son of God, keeping every part of the law that we're guilty of breaking in our stead, even to the point of death on a cross. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's not just Jesus. He's the anointed one the Messiah, the long-anticipated and promised one, the one who has been set apart by God himself for the service of God. He is the Christ. Later in Mark's gospel, chapter 8, Jesus was questioning his disciples and saying to them, who do people say that I am? The disciples responded to him saying, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, but others say one of the prophets. Jesus continued by questioning them, 
Okay, let's bring it home a little bit. Not, do, not what do they say about me, but who do you say that I am? And Peter spoke up and said to Jesus, you are the Christ. You're the long-awaited one, the one we've been looking for, anxiously awaiting your arrival. Christ's life, along with his death, allows mercy and justice to meet together, for righteousness and peace to kiss each other. Because of Christ's office, because of his role, because of his work, God is both faithful and just to not condemn us, though we deserve condemnation. He is faithful and just to forgive us, though we don't deserve to be forgiven, to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness because of Christ. And Jesus didn't stop there. He didn't stop with coming and living and dying, but he was raised again. The the miracle of the baby in the womb has become the miracle of the empty tomb. And he sits now, this Christ sits enthroned as our advocate, ever living to make intercession for every single one of his children, pleading our cause at God's right hand in the court of heaven, urging his own merits, all the benefits that he earned for us. He is urging the Father to apply them to us, presenting his own shed blood there on the mercy seat, filling the holy place with the incense of his own intercession for his people. We obtain eternal, everlasting mercies by virtue of Christ's death and his ongoing intercession for us. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus, the Christ. And Mark doesn't even stop there. The Son of God. He's the Son of God. Further implications of his deity. This Christ, he shares glory and power with God himself. How can it be? Because he is God. He is one in essence, Father, Son, and Spirit. Jesus' understanding of his own deity is revealed in all four of the Gospels. He clearly saw himself as God. We can see it taking place in a number of ways. In his teaching, he taught with divine authority. Matthew 7, when Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. The teachers of the law in Jesus' day had no authority of their own. Their authority came from their use of earlier authorities. Even Moses and the other Old Testament prophets and authors didn't speak in their own authority, but would often say, thus saith the Lord, or this is what the Lord says. Jesus, on the other hand, when he's interpreting the law, you remember how he said it? You have heard that it was said, but I say to you. He spoke of his own, on his own initiative, by his own authority. Jesus had a unique relationship with God, his Father. At 12, why is it that you were looking for me? He asked his parents. Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? This is a radical statement of unique, intimate relationship with God. It was unacceptable for anyone to simply refer to God as their father. Jesus' favorite self-designation was the title, Son of Man. We'll see that as we work our way through the gospel according to Mark. Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man indicating that he sees himself as the messianic son of man that was prophesied about in the Old Testament, Daniel 7 and other places. Jesus establishes his divine authority as the glorious messianic son of man by declaring that he has the power to forgive sin and that he is Lord of the Sabbath. This happens really early on in Mark, Mark chapter 2, verse 10, so that you may know Jesus says that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up and pick up your pallet and go home. He's the Son of God. So he has the power to forgive sins. He goes on later in Mark 2, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Here's Jesus, the man, Jesus, saying I am the Lord even of the Sabbath. 
Jesus' teaching emphasized his own understanding of his identity as the Son of God. He came teaching the kingdom of God, and to Jesus in that kingdom, he was the king. He questioned his disciples in Mark 8. We considered it already, but who do you say that I am? That is the ultimate inquiry of his ministry. It it really is a wonderful way for us to start our day, each day answering the question from Christ, who do you say that I am? You are the Christ. You are king. Another evidence of Jesus understanding himself being the son of God, he, he received worship. This may be the most radical demonstration of his belief that he was God. He, when he was worshipped, he accepted that worship. If Jesus didn't believe he was God, he should have vehemently protested and, and rejected being worshipped. For a monotheistic Jew like Jesus to accept worship from other monotheistic Jews shows that Jesus realized that he possessed divine identity. He was God, and it was right for people to worship him. He even went so far to equate himself with his father, which resulted in the Jewish leaders accusing him of blasphemy. He answered them, my father is working until now, and I myself am working. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but he was also calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Jesus did this in a number of places. Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Therefore, they picked up stones to throw at him, John chapter 8 tells us, and Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Or later in John 10, I and the Father are one, Jesus says. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? The Jews answered and said, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Mark, who watched the life of Christ, witnessed it firsthand, begins his gospel making abundantly clear that Jesus is God, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Because Jesus is God, because he is divine, a few things are true. God can be known definitively and personally in Christ. What a glorious thing for us. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. Who has see, he who has seen me has seen the Father. Because Jesus is divine, we can know God. He is our access. No one comes to the Father but through him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. We can know God personally and intimately because Jesus is God. Because Jesus is divine, redemption is possible and has been accomplished in Christ. I read it earlier. There's one man, one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Because Jesus is divine and he has been raised, ascended, and enthroned, we have a sympathetic high priest who has omnipotent power to meet our needs. And fourthly, I didn't number any of the other ones, so if you're taking notes, now you're really confused. This is like sub, sub, sub points that I haven't referenced until now, so you're welcome. (laughs) Because Jesus is God, worship of and obedience to him are appropriate and necessary. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ the Son of God. He is God's Son. You heard it in the reading, verse 11. You are my beloved Son at his baptism. In you I am well pleased. And then at the transfiguration, this is my beloved Son, the booming voice from heaven. Listen to him. And then as he hangs there on the cross, The soldier on the ground, truly this man was the son of God. 
or the words of Christ himself. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Which really, Mark 10, 45, is the theme of the entire gospel that Mark has written for us. The Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. What is the gospel? A celebratory announcement of the good news that Christ has come to save sinners. Which begs this question in closing. I should say these questions in closing. Is the gospel good news? Is it good news that Christ has come to the world to save sinners? Let's take it a step further. Is the gospel good news to you? Is it good news to you that Christ has come to save sinners? I promise you qualify to be saved. He came to save sinners. We all qualify. Is the gospel good news? Is it good news to you? It can be. It is good news to you if and only if Christ is your king. If he is your everything. Is Christ your identity? Have you identified with him? With him hanging on the cross and suffering the penalty for your sin? I suppose we could say it like this. Our identity is in one of two places this morning. Either with him hanging on the cross or with the crowd saying crucify him. There is no neutrality with Christ the King. Come to him. Find your all in all in this God-man. Find forgiveness and hope and everlasting life both now and forever. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your Son, for your grace and mercy and love. We thank you for the gospel, for your plan to redeem a people for yourself, that you've included so many of us in that plan. And God, we praise you that this morning your ear isn't too dull to hear and your arm isn't too short to save. We pray that you would listen that you would hear us asking for you to save souls and that you would act rolling up your sleeve and rescuing men and women and boys and girls for your own glory. God, we thank you for salvation in Christ. We pray that you will help us to live with the constant awareness of your love for us as demonstrated through sending your own dear son to give his life, to die in our place, to be buried carrying our sins as far as the east is from the west and rising again on the third day. God, we thank you that this glorious one, your son, sits at your right hand as our great high priest. God, we pray, Hear us and hear him. Hear him pleading our cause for us. See him and his blood shed on our behalf as we come to worship and to pray. Aid us in every area of our lives. We long to be pleasing, sweet-smelling aromas of life unto you. Grant us that as your people, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.